Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. Have you ever thought about living on a movie location? Let's say near Iverson. You've heard of Iverson, but you've seen the Lone Ranger Rock. Well, our guest today, Steve Stevens, actor, agent, producer, writer, roper. He's going to join me today. Steve, welcome. Hey, Rob. Glad you're here, pal. Or Thank I you, guess buddy. I should say I'm glad it's your place. Thank you. you welcome got, here. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you got a few stills of yourself uh, yep. up here. This is uh, a nice museum. It's the Ego Garage. Yeah. <laughs> now, where you're living here is right under the Lone Ranger Rock. Yes. <laughs> and, and just the so people can just visualize, you know, where we are. Um, just, I can spit and get to the Lone Ranger Rock. Um, I'm glad Clayton's not there. Not then. there anymore. <laughs> Just past the Lone Ranger Rock, you'll see this giant rock going up there, and on top of it is a tree. And that's been in there since, you know, the 40s. In all the movies, it's, it's, it's so you can, you can see it. Some Gary Cooper movies and... and it's, it's just, it's there, and you recognize it. Uh, across from that is the iconic Garden of the Gods, where it's the first time that you see John Wayne with the saddle, okay, and the stagecoach comes up, and he gets on it and goes through the Garden of the Gods. It was in so many movies, you know, and they're, they're almost like people. These, well, don't people come and hike and visit all yes. these locations? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, not as much as they used to. It was in because um, those people are getting older and older, and the younger generation they're not watching. Well, the there there are a lot of people that even live here. There's 240 townhouses, and most of the people don't even know where they're living. Don't know the history here, mm -hmm. and and even now I see people, you know, coming up and taking pictures in front of the Lone Ranger mm -hmm. Rock stuff like that. And for me, working here, you know, uh, so many years ago. Uh, I actually shot Gunsmoke here, I shot Zorro here, and I shot the Roy Rogers show here. Being on that show, I know you had some great scenes with Pat Brady. Yes. How fast was that in terms of, you know, we've talked about other half hour shows, just knocking them out in two and a half days. Was this like that? I, well? don't, I don't remember it being that fast. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Roy lived down the block. You know, literally, mm -hmm. you know. That's why uh, they picked. On, on Alaska, that's why they work here, mm -hmm. back and forth. Uh, and it was like, they worked all day, but I think it was like in the winter, so the sun would go down, there's a lot of natural lighting. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, four or five days. I don't remember it being three days like mm -hmm. some of the other shows. Uh, maybe because Roy would never really memorize his lines they had a teleprompter and in those days it was literally a box with a paper scroll in it and they cranked it so i always had a problem i would come in in the morning and rory would say oh by the way um you know that scene we're going to do don't worry about it. they change the lines you know whatever just use the teleprompter i hadn't used it before and so that's when the whole cuss box thing came about because without my glasses, I really couldn't see it and read it, you know, and I, I memorized part of it because I'm dyslexic on top of it, not having glasses, you know, so every time I'd cuss, it would be Gail right over there, put a quarter in there. Oh, they were great, yeah. Got well, great people. Their home life, what was their home life like? Well, uh, I would be over there like And they have just so many other kids. Yeah, shooting, shooting pool. Mm -hmm. Cheryl would like to shoot pool. Uh, and, and Roy had his own pool table. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Of course. And Roy and Dale, would, it was like a regular San Fernando Valley family. You would never get the feeling of movie stars. You get the feeling that, uh, yeah, these people had a couple of bucks because the house, you know, was mm -hmm. big. Um, but they parked Nellie Bell in the garage, mm -hmm. the Jeep. Uh, was, Bullet, the dog, was there. Was Trigger there? No. Mm -hmm. Trigger was at the Wranglers. Glenn Randall? Glenn Randall, Randall's place. I just happened to know. Right, yeah, yeah. you just happened to know that. <laughs> Fed you the line, right? Fed it to you. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I knew you would know that. Uh, but, you know, to, to, to have Nellie build the Jeep there and pull it there, because they can just drive up, up the hill mm -hmm. instead of like parking him up here and pay for a day, you know, rental. 
Uh, and it was like, you know, there, Roy would come in without his shirt on, you know, go to the liquor cabinet, love to have a drink, you know. Uh, Dale was always like on the phone talking to somebody about, you know, writing another book. Looking back through some of your early work, and when I was growing up, Zorro was a favorite show, not just of mine, but everybody's. I was Zorro one Halloween, of course, but you, <laughs> yeah. you got to be in a Zorro with Guy Williams. What was Guy Williams like? He was one of the good guys. Yeah. One of the good guys. Uh, I was a little bit nervous when I first went on the set um, because uh, it was one of the first times that the whole show was around my character. Uh, and I walked on the set, and before I can turn around, I hear, hey, Steve. I turn around, it's Guy Williams. His hand is extended out. He says, hey, welcome to the show. I love your work. You got any questions? You need anything? You come to me. <laughs> and 10 years later, I wound up being his agent. Wow. Was he that cordial all the time? To everybody. Really? Everybody. To the extras, mm -hmm. not just the actors. Mm -hmm. To everybody, and so he, and he, and he also didn't run to his dressing room. You know, lunchtime, this and that would hang out. Anybody wanted autographs. Anybody wanted pictures. Yeah, he was one of the really good guys. Well, I, I know that the star of a series sets the tone for everybody. You're right. And that must have been a joy to work with. It was. Guy Williams. He replaced. Pernell Roberts on Bonanza yes. for just a little little bit. Right. Uh, what did he think about that? I know you were his agent later after that, right. after uh, Lost in Space. Did he ever talk about Bonanza? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it's the only time, in, in, and I had a, quite a long association with Guy, uh, and was really a sweetheart of a man. Uh, I never heard him say anything derogatory about anybody. And he didn't mention names. And I asked him, you know, loving Westerns, that he, he got to be in top Western series. He said it was not comfortable. He said a lot of egos on the set. Mm. He said I didn't care for it. And that's why it wasn't on very long. I just couldn't deal with it. Show you show business sometimes could really be some El Crapo. When they did the new Zorro, they were thinking that maybe he would play the father. Mm -hmm. and wanted him to come in and read at Disney for the part. But could you imagine, they wanted their Zorro mm -hmm. to come in and have to read for the part of the father. And he said, no, I don't and think so. And that's when you were representing him. Yeah. To me, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's getting into to ego. Oh, well, let's bring Guy Williams in and have him read. You well, know. perhaps the people who wanted him to read they didn't, didn't know who he was. Clue. They probably, right. they probably that's, never that's saw. What happened. Probably it? never saw the original. Didn't know who he was. Sad. That's you know, a sad state of like the Like that business. old Shelley Winters story. You yeah. know, what have you done? Here's my two Oscars. <laughs> Bringing them up one at a time. <laughs> yeah, what right. else have you done? Here's another <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> yeah, uh, Annette right. was in some of those too. Yeah, wasn't she? she did. She did a two-parter and called me and said, "I'm going to be on the show," because she had a crush on Guy. All young ladies had a crush on Guy. And, and all the younger boys and, had a crush yes, on uh, that. Yes, <laughs> you're right. And, and so she was just so thrilled. And, 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 and I haven't met him. What is he like? I said, he's probably going to want to give you a hug. Yeah, that was a Disney show, but didn't you work with Annette on a Disney series? Too? Yes, I did. Um, the year before, mm -hmm. um, her first starring role was her own series called Annette. And I played a boyfriend mm -hmm. and sued her. Mm -hmm. And then we became good friends. And the PR department thought, well, they look good together. So it was the Academy Awards and the, you know, the Emmys, the Golden Globes, you know, and all the movie magazines and all the teenage boys around the United States. We, the world were jealous of me. Uh, we weren't lovers. We were good friends. But all the magazines would say, oh, you know, what's going on? They're lovers or this or that, you know. So this big magazine article and photo play one of those came out and it had Annette on the top and then it had a picture of Annette uh, and Frankie Avalon and Annette and Paul Anka and Annette I forget and somebody else and then it said but we know who her real true lover is it's Steve Stevens been there all the time <laughs> Well, you did have a thing going with her. Well, though, didn't yeah, you? you know, some I guess you know you Google it, you know, and there's questions. 
uh, were they really lovers? And a lot of them says yes, but you know, that was... Well, I want to know what do you say, though? Well, it's it long ago, long, long, 60 some odd years ago, I don't remember. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> she, she was a great lady. Oh, and and yeah. I, I'm going to end with a net story that um, the night before I was going to go to boot camp in the Marines, she called me and she said, come on over. I want to take you someplace. And I thought it was like out to dinner or something. And we got into her new Thunderbird. She loved it. And the uh, 57 Thunderbird. And we drove. She lived in Studio City uh, to St. Charles Catholic Church. And You're going to get out. married with Annette? <laughs> she grabbed my hand. And I still didn't know what was happening. And she says, come on, let's pray. And she grabbed my hand. We walked all the way to the altar. We were the only ones in this giant church. And she says, I just want to pray that you're going to be okay. Boy, that is nice. That was, that's. No wonder everybody loved her, though. She that's was, what, I mean, uh, she was the real deal. Yeah. You know, yeah. the real, the real deal. Um, one, <laughs> you can edit this out if you want. One, 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 one more, Annette's story. I had written a book called King of the Sunset Strip. And when I was 19, uh, I wound up being part of Public Enemy Number no. One's crew, Nicky Cohen. Uh, and it's the only book ever written about the Hollywood mob, somebody who was there. Well, I put in this book a little true story that Fred Sika, who came in from the mob in New York to watch Mickey Cohen's back and was the real deal made guy invited me over for dinner and his dear wife was there and she was very upset about something and she kept on talking to him in Italian you know, what, what, what's going on she's pointing at me and she didn't like it and she finally got up and I said Freddie what, what's going on and he said look and he pulls out this movie magazine and it says Paul Anka is jealous of Steve Stevens and is going to take care of him. Okay. Do you want us to take care of him? <laughs> well, I knew what that meant. Paul was saying maybe he's going to punch me in the nose, but this was the real. And I went, no. I mean, Mama thought it was real. Mm. Mama Sika thought that was yeah. real, right? Scared the hell out of me. Yeah. So to this day, Paul Anka doesn't know that He's still around because well. I said, no, no, Fred. No. <laughs> wow, that is exciting. What a memory that is. You did some early work. Yes. You did uh, a Bowery Boys movie, Private Eyes. Yes, I And did. your brother, who was an actor as well, was he in He did that. Private Eyes and Bowery Boys Meets the Monster. He did both of those. Um, I was 13 years old selling newspapers at Hollywood and Vine. Uh, had a lot of moxie and was, you know, yelling, extra, extra, read all about it in the days when you had big black letters saying extra, whether it was extra or not, you know, what am I going to do, just stand there? Uh, and this uh, gentleman comes over and he says, hey, kid, he says, I like the way you yell extra. I'm a movie producer and I'm thinking, you know, I'm a street kid. I already, who is this pervert? And he could tell the way I looked at me. He says, no, no, let me give you my card. I said, well, I have an agent. Well, in those days, all the kids had an agent. It was the agent's guild, and you paid $50 a month, and now you had an agent, right? And they had hundreds. Uh, so he says, here's the card. Give it to your folks. Give it to your agent. I go home. I give it to my dad. He calls my agent, and two weeks later, I'm working on the movie. Worked on it a week. Uh, and, and, of course, as a kid, as the, I mean, the Bowery Boys, I mean, working with my yeah, heroes. Was it as wild and crazy as... As it would seem with Hunts Hall and, and Leo Gorsi. Uh, it wasn't that wild thing. What they did, as soon as they yelled cut, they'd all run to and play poker. Okay? <laughs> that was it. And in those days, I had found out it was illegal to gamble on the sound stages. Okay? But they would all go. And, and of course, not hang out with all the kids. They'd, you know, it was part of it was shot on a Saturday when the studios worked on Saturdays as well. And all the kids, they go this, they were around different places. I was just mesmerized. Now I'm watching the Bowery Boys play poker out of character, you know? And that, and that was just ex exciting for me. And that was like, 
you know, the start, and then other things started coming. I got in a Screen Actors Guild at 13. It cost $125 to join. You know, now it's, what, thousands. Steve, thanks for joining us. You said there was something else you wanted to share with me. Yes. It's my lovely wife who just passed. Uh, the reason she's on this cover and the cover of some other Dog World magazine, she won the Purina Invitational twice wow. and was a great lady in her own right. Uh, and I just wanted to share that with everybody. If all those who knew her, you know, loved her. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to be wow. part of this. She was a, a sweetheart. Okay. Steve, thanks for joining us today. And more great stories. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you.